Hello and welcome to chapter six of Little Free Library Unbound, where we'll be talking about Little Free Libraries in unexpected locations. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us this afternoon. Um, my colleague Shelby has just shared some information about how to have the best viewing experience today. So you can adjust your screen so you can see both the speakers and our slides. If you have any questions, um, tech-wise or otherwise, you are welcome to leave them in the chat. And my colleague Shelby will try to answer questions as quickly as she's able. And without further ado, um, I'm going to start us off with a poll to see who's here with us today. So if you would answer this poll, which best describes you? Are you a little free library steward with a library of your own? Are you an LFL user patron who regularly uses Little Free Libraries? Are you just an LFL supporter? You're a fan of the organization and Little Free Libraries and just wanna see what's up. We always have such an interesting mix of people who are able to join us. So that's really cool to see. It's not all one group that's all the same. It's a little bit different every time. Like we have a lot of stewards and supporters. Awesome, thank you. Without further ado, I will introduce Anita Marina, who is our Little Free Library National Board Chair and our moderator for Little Free Library Unbound. Hello, everyone. It's so nice to be here again for Little Free Library Unbound's latest chapter, and this will be Little Free Libraries in Uncommon Places. So I'm very, very excited to be with you and to talk about where we have found Little Free Libraries and to talk to two very special people who place them in just really exciting places. Um, this is an exciting one because commonly you think of Little Free Libraries at schools and parks, at playgrounds, residences, or community centers. And some stewards are really creative about placing their libraries and serving these unique communities. We've got a couple of examples here, including this one Little Free Library in Puglia, Italy, and then another Little Free Library at Third Man Records and Books in Nashville. And if you are a White Stripes fan and Jack White of the White Stripes record label, they have an independent bookstore and their publishing arm is called Third Man Books. And that's where the library is located. So very, very cool. So we are rocking it as people say. <laughs> and then in China, which is really, uh, really fun and interesting, the Super Malls Company has these really, really unique libraries installed in every single one of their different malls all over the country. And uh, that would be a really fun kind of trip to see. And I'm sure the kids really, really love that. Um, and then in Minneapolis, Nokomis uh, Book Tattoo Store has Tattoo Shop has a library of its own that is an actual exact replica of the tattoo shop. And you can see one of their wonderful adoring patrons there. And it's a really, really exciting, exciting place to be. Um, but that's not the only place where you can find a lot of your libraries. And um, there are also non-physical locations and little free libraries end up in, um, in different parts of our lives, including the media. There's an example of Little Free Library uh, with Nicola Yoon. It came out last week and the character has a Little Free Library. And then there's a really fun short story that was published early this year and by Naomi Kritzer about Little Free Library. And you can check out um, Naomi Kritzer's story um, on the website, Shelby used to share that. And we've seen them all over in the background and movies, TV shows, or commercials. And our very own Shelby King was watching the movie Timmy Failer on Disney Plus with her daughters when it and when it came out, she noticed there was this little free library based, a uh, little free library in the movie. And it's based on a series by Stefan Pastis. So if you have middle schoolers, middle grade visitors, you can um, take a look and take a look at the books. But we have a very special guest. Um, Dr. Weschel Schnell is an atmospheric scientist and a rock star and a little free ad library advocate and a Todd Bull uh, support steward award. Um, the, in addition to installing the first Little Free Library at the South Pole, 
He's a, this would mean that we have little free libraries on all seven continents. This is very exciting. So thank you, Dr. Schnell. He's also helped to build and install over 30 little free libraries all over the world. And most recently, Dr. Schnell has built a, built a little free library kit that fits in a suitcase that can be transported easily to places uh, where shipping might be an obstacle. And we were just talking uh, with Dr. Schnell about places that he's been to and it's Kenya and it's South Africa. So welcome, welcome Dr. Schnell. It's so exciting to have you here. And Shelby will clue him in. So Dr. Schnell. I think we'll have you unmute and uh, we'll get the video up. So aren't those cute? I mean, you can actually see the photo of it, uh, of the Little Free Library at the South Pole and then the happy readers. All right, I'm waiting for us. Let's see if we've got him. I know he was there a minute ago. All right. Let's see. Oh, um, Dr. Schnell, if you could accept the, the Zoom invite, and then you can un unmute your video. A um, little bit, a couple of uh, technical difficulties, but we'll, we'll have you come on again. In the meantime, you can see what a delightful person. And he's actually uh, broadcasting or doing his Zoom uh, where, his, where he builds a lot of these little free libraries. Uh, in a, in his home. In I, I'm on now, is that? Uh, yeah. We, we have you, um, and if you can accept the video, um, there's a request to accept uh, the video invite. Uh, we can see you. Um, I think there'll be a little message from Shelby on there. Uh, I can see on the screen, so I, I would assume other people could see me. Okay, well, then let's talk. Um, we'll we'll figure out. There you go. Um, my video's on there. Oh, there he is. There you are. Now we can see you. I can see you. All right. So my first question, and we're so excited that you're on here, is what has what inspired you to install Little Free Libraries in all of these really different locations? Um, two reasons. One, when I was young, I only had one book. Well, uh, child, I lived in a isolated, semi-religious community, 200 miles from any real town, and the only book other than the Bible, of course, was a, a little book that said uh, something to affect when I grow up. But um, later in life, my daughter wanted to ask if I could build a little free library. I'd never seen or heard anything about it. I did put it in her yard. She. She lives in St. in St. Louis, Missouri, and the uh, library was. Uh, she lives in a very uh, ghetto, basically. And when she filled it up with books, all the kids Saturday morning would line up and and take books. So um, she said, "Why don't you build one for some schools?" So I built a couple more, and then they were popular. So then I built one for our yard, and it was popular. And I like woodworking and. Um, I just started to keep building them. I use repurposed material. I start with a cabinet door from a, a kitchen cabinet, and then that determines the shape and size of the library. And the part of the game is only using recycled material. Ah. So I go to a recycle center. I go to uh, <clears throat> places like Home Depot that has a cull pile, and that's how I get the, the, the library set up and uh, built. But then... Um, as I build them, I put them in my front yard on the garage driveway and people drive by and say, oh, man, you know, my daughter living some there would like one. And then it just keeps uh, mushrooming. And as a scientist, I traveled all over the world to my job. I could take 140 pounds of luggage with me if I wanted to. So I would just take a library and stick them in different countries, different places I go. And it, it just keeps growing. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's it's just a magical feeling too. What's what's been the biggest logistical challenge for you because of having to go to these different locations? Um, getting the airlines uh, to take a package that's a little bigger than they normally would. Uh, I've had to, two rejected, and I had to send them back home. But mm -hmm. now 
I make them a little smaller or make them in different pieces. And then when I get to the location, I put them back together. Uh, so if you don't have the roof on them and you don't have some of the support, it makes a much smaller package. And then just finish it off when I get there. Wow, that's great. Um, I just wanted to make a note, Mary Clausen, who's one of our students there says, there, there's a little few library in Savage, Minnesota at the historical marker at the site of one of the World War II uh, Japanese internment camps. And that's quite a um, significant place to have one. Um, another question is, is, do you add any specific types of book, especially for people who frequent the libraries in locations like the South Pole or uh, South Africa, or, or do you kind of include a little of everything? What do you um, like to do? For the South Pole, we put in books that, uh, as you know, the South Pole, nine months of the year, you're absolutely isolated. You cannot get in or out. If you get sick, goodbye, you die there. Yeah. Um, and everything is white. And even in the middle of winter, when it's totally dark for six months, uh, the, the northern or southern lights and the moon make it bright and everything's white. So the people there like to see something with color, with trees, with flowers, uh, things like that, because yeah. they miss that, of course. Yeah. Um, this is, I, I put up some of these libraries like opposite, uh, well, let's say I put, in, I put one up recently in a mobile home park that was totally uh, housed by 300 uh, Spanish families and all the children were Spanish speaking. So I contacted a lady in Colorado who has Spanish books and we just load that library up and it's really popular because the kids don't have access to books very well. During the pandemic, they don't have much to do. They ride their bikes around and walk around, the, but they can't leave the park. So they just love these books. So we've put hundreds of them in that place. Oh, good for you. And it's a great way, one, to see their own language, but also to see other locations, to see other other worlds through the pages of a book. Let's see. Ah, look at this. He's got This is a eyes. sign my daughter made, and I stick it in all the libraries. Oh. And once you put this up, you never have to put books up yourself. People just load them up. And it's, it's amazing. There's never a library that goes empty that I've ever seen. Yeah. Yeah, it's very, I found a few in Rice University. So when the students come back, um, it's uh, they're, they're gonna fill them up again. Um, are there any locations that are particularly special to you of all the locations that you've been to? Are there some that yes. are most special? Um, the one in Warrenamble, Warrenamble, I can't say it. My wife is here with us. She was, at, we both went to um, the Southwest part of Australia where there's a Aboriginal area. And we put a library in there. And you saw a picture earlier on of an Aboriginal girl and then an older one. And the library book I'm holding open has a painting of her that someone made years ago. And it was in this library book. So I purchased this book and put it in the library. I don't know who took it, but she was quite pleased to show this picture of her as a younger girl painted in this, this library book. That's really, really special. Yeah. Now, the one that's going in this week maybe tomorrow, is in Gula, G-U-L-U, -U, Uganda. And anybody is interested, look up G-U-L-U, -U, Uganda and Lord's Resistance Army. You may have heard of hundreds of girls abducted to be taken away as sex slaves and their parents killed. That's right, the center of this area. And there's um, that'll be a, a library there. And along with the library went 200 pounds of books from Boulder uh, area that will go be put into this library over time. Wow, I'm just see the pictures of it. This library was made completely constructed and then deconstructed. And as you mentioned earlier, so it fit in a suitcase. Uh, so the, the like the sides would become apart and the back and the roof, everything just wow. a little package because the person taking it had to put it in a suitcase. That's amazing. What a, what a tribute, what a special place, because very often in many, many places, you know, it's very hard to not only provide access to books for, for young people, but for, for girls, education is, is often um, a point of denial. So this is... Another interesting library is one I took that's growing. Uh, I took it to the base of Mount Fuji. As you know, in Japan, there's a, a Mount Fuji where people walk up it's kind of a religious thing. Once in your life, you've got to make the 
the walk up to the top of the mountain. And this week or next, the library will be installed right near the top of the mountain, probably the highest in the world, because it's okay. going to be up to 13 so or 14. So we have your wife there. So we want to yes. think it's a good opportunity to ask her if there's a favorite place or a favorite story about Dr. Snell building or installing or sharing a little free library and books. You have the floor. I didn't get, no, you. I didn't get, I didn't yeah. hear. I want you to you talk. Favorite story? Hi, my name is Swan. And they want to know what, what about libraries. Go closer. Uh, I work in a library in the Boulder City Library. Ah. I teach ESL uh, nearly every day uh, over Zoom. Terrific. And we have internationals who come to learn the English language. And we just have conversations in English. Great. And sharing books. That's all. Swan is from Singapore, but, but one early part of our life. Um, we, we moved to Africa and uh, she was very pregnant at the time and the baby was born the week after we got there uh, in the native hospital. And my job during the birth was to kill the flies and birds and chase the birds away because there's no windows with, with screens. So these birds and the insects were coming through the room all the time. You're a good husband and a good caretaker. Yeah. So Good. Huh. Ask her the, <laughs> that the, was a long time ago, so there was no videoing or, or we didn't have cell phones at the time. That was 40 some years ago. Wow. Thank goodness for that, I think, for, for some people. Um, and your workshop is right there, Dr. Snell. So um, so someone is asking, what's your, what, what is your background? Um, uh, you know, I'm an atmospheric scientist. Uh -huh. uh, the composition of the atmosphere, basically the gases that are changing the climate, carbon dioxide and methane. And we have stations all over the world that are monitoring the changing atmosphere everywhere. And my job, part of my job, I was deputy director of the organization, was to go to most of these places and check up on the staff and encourage them and working with people in different countries to take these measurements because we'd send around a bottle a little bigger than this, but made out of glass. And every week people would fill two bottles of these at 70 locations at the most remote places you can visualize on earth, send them back to Boulder. We look inside these bottles and we can tell how the atmosphere is changing. We can tell everything that's in the atmosphere. We can do 70 to 80 different gases. So we can see when the economies are changing, when they're burning more fossil fuels. We have them in China. Um, as you know, at the South Pole, on the top of the Greenland ice cap, uh, different places in Russia, Africa, you name it, we've got a site like that. That's incredible. That's, uh, you know, not something that, that uh, very many people really think of when you, when you, no. when you think of, uh, of work. So, um, and uh, have you always been a librarian, Doc, uh, the Mrs., we call you Mrs. Shell, this is, um, yeah, my name is Swan, like the bird. Uh, so I have not always worked uh, at the library. It was during COVID-19 that I started um, Zooming, Zooming to ESL. I am a counselor. I really work with the senior population. Um, uh, we have an organization with mental health partners where we try to help our senior citizens live the best life they can given conditions of aging and wherever they're at. Well, you're good role models for that and sharing the richness of your own lives and, and so many good stories. So I really appreciate you taking the time. Um, I think we'll, we'll have you stay on um, for the end because we might have some more questions for you, but I, I believe that we, uh, we'll go on to our next uh, panelist, uh, but we will reserve maybe some questions. Um, somebody did ask if you are, Dr. Schnell, if you're part of the Climate Reality Project. Uh, I'm not aware. No, I'm not. Um, we are a government agency and uh, we are called the Honesty Brokers of Climate. So what we do is we take absolutely the best measurements possible, make them public. Some of the measurements are available within 30 seconds of us taking them. And then we put the science out, but we don't get involved with any other organizations or any politics. So our data is totally 
totally trusted around the world. Um, about last year, we uh, we also measure uh, ozone depleting gases, and we picked up from our station in Hawaii a few molecules of gas that we traced back to China, and China was part of the Montreal Protocol, and they had agreed to not more produce any more of this certain chemical. We picked up a few molecules of it, talked to the Chinese government. They accepted it right away. They believed us. And within about three months, that total source, whatever it was, it was probably refrigeration, insulation they were making. And we picked out the town in China where this was coming from, and they accepted it immediately and believed us because we have this unassailable record uh, of doing good science and being very open about it. We actually, I, it's great. I could, we could talk about science forever. Uh, we do have one more question, a little book related question for, for you, Dr. Snell. And, and that is what did having books or not having books mean to you as a child? And I think you did mention a little bit about that um, when you had just the one, the one book and very little, but, but what did having, having those books or yeah. not having books mean to you? I don't know what it would be if I'd have had more books, but what, what we did do, or what I did do is I learned, I had a lot of relatives. I had 283 relatives in the area. Um, all grandparents, uncles and aunts all lived around. So instead of being in reading books, I was out visiting and working in the community with the kids. So life was life was great, great in that way. But I, I, I think other people or other kids these days don't have, who don't have chance to books don't have that opportunity. Yeah, they don't, and that that is why we do um, we do our impact libraries and our reading color libraries. It is so important to create these places where um, you know where books can be found in, in unusual locations. So we're really really pleased. Um, it, so one did, one quick question, and we'll go on to Nicole. Was if you were to choose one topic, you feel a first child's book would have what would it what would it be so if you had a colorful to... pictures that would relate to the child's family situation or something they could relate to so they could connect with that right away you know that, either pictures of parents grandparents dogs cats something something they can connect to with in color immediately uh, yeah. that they would them to the book yeah and that's as much a pleasure for the person sharing the book as well. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot that can take place with uh, books and uh, with sharing, reading aloud, or even talking about the picture. This is really, really terrific. Um, one thing we'll do is um, there is a question about where to find Dr. Schnell's data, and we'll get that on the, the chat section um, in the post notes. So we thank you. Uh, thank you both for sharing your stories and sharing your time. And hang on there. We will have. Um, uh, our, another, our next panelist and uh, more information for all of you, but it's so delightful. Um, I can't wait to talk to you again. So maybe we'll have to revisit you. <laughs> Thank you very both very, very much. Thank all right. you. So we have our next uh, panelist and very excited. And you know, we are joined by Nicole Sullivan the owner of Book Bar Denver, a combination bookstore and wine bar, who wouldn't love that? Uh, Book Bar is home to two Little Free Libraries, one at the bookstore and one in their author bed and breakfast upstairs. Um, we are very excited. They even have a bookmobile to distribute books even further. So we are very excited to, um, to share and welcome Nicole. We are very excited to see you here and can't wait to hear your stories. Hi. Hi, can are you there? Me okay. So we, our first question for you is what inspired you to install your little few libraries in this location or these locations? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we, I can okay. hear you. Everybody Great. hear you okay? And Perfect. Shelby has shared your book bar website, so. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, I've always been a fan of Little Free Library and, um, you know, obviously just getting books to people. So when I opened my bookstore in 2013, um, that was one of the first plans we had. We installed um, a Little Free Library out front that you saw in the picture there um, with, the, with the build out of the rest of the store. Um, and then when we added the, um, author B&B &B upstairs a couple of years later, 
Um, of course, we knew it had to have a, a little free library. I mean, we could just put a bookshelf in there and you know invite people to just kind of leave books, but it had to be an official little free library. So we have the, the plaque with the charter number on it. Um, and for anybody who's traveling, you know, especially if you're gonna be staying above a bookstore or if you're an author, um, it's good to have books there. And people always travel with books. So it's been good for people to just leave a book and take a book and, um, and uh, we find some interesting things up there sometimes. And uh, we, you know, fill it in with our own stock and um, it, it just in, invites more collaboration with our guests and our customers than being just a, a retail bookstore. So explain how that Arthur Ben Breakfast, so this is, these are authors who are visiting your bookstore or the area or how does, how would that work? Oops, are you still there? She's frozen. Let's see. I think we've lost Nicole temporarily. Oh, I'm here. Okay. <laughs> there she is. Can we see you and hear you? Can you? Can you? Yeah, I can hear you now. There you go, Nicole. Okay. I'm sorry. I don't know what happened. Other than, you know, we're, we're all still home and on the internet, so... That's okay. Um, so my, my question was, how does your author bed and breakfast work? So is there, are these for visiting authors to your bookstore or yes. other authors who come through the area and just say, hey, you know, I would love a place that supports, you know, authors and books and it's a fun, you know, what's this? Yeah, so, you know, pre-pandemic, it was, um, it's there for, it was there for authors who would come and visit us and um, do events at the store. It was also in, on Airbnb. Um, so we would have paying guests whenever we didn't have authors. Um, but then during the pandemic, I took, of course, took it off the market and um, we partnered with a local uh, writing organization, Lighthouse Writers Workshop. And for the past year, ish we have been um hosting some of their writers and their their writing faculty for a writers in residence program um and that's been that's been really good for everybody you know we've got an apartment we don't want it to just sit empty and it's been great for the authors to give them some space outside of their own homes and um and write some books and we've been told that we saved a lot of marriages that way this <laughs> That would, it would be mine if my if I were writing a book where my husband were. So yeah, we'll yeah. have to keep you in mind the next the next time for you. Oh, um, I was yeah, I was tempted yeah. to write a book just so I could go stay there for a week. <laughs> <laughs> well, then I think there's a library hotel in New York, so I'll there focus is. on that. So I, you know, yep. I think we'll just have to have a separate map for that Airbnbs or uh, places that uh, we can find you. Um, <laughs> what was the biggest logistical challenge in installing um, your libraries and and how did you overcome those for their uh, things that you um, faced and uh, in this location and out and or even with the pandemic too so um. yeah I think the biggest um, with the bookstore is that it's surrounded by a lot of concrete so there wasn't a space where we could just stick it into the ground um, right. so we mounted it against a brick wall um, which which is always a little bit of a challenge um, cause it's just freestanding and, and anchored right into the brick wall. And so far, so far it's holding up. Um, we also have a, um, a, a nonprofit organization that operates and I meant to send you a photo ahead of time and I didn't, but it's a, um, it's operates kind of like a big little free library. So oh, it's cool. a, it's a location where we encourage people to come and drop off book donations and then we sort them by genre and then we pull them and um, get them donated out to the community. Um, it's called Book Give. So if you want to check it out, it's it's book. Thank you. Thanks, Shelby. There you go. There it is. <laughs> Denver.org. Um, and you know, I just learned yesterday that um, Book Give is actually on your little free library website as a resource for people to come and pick up books who need to restock their libraries. And we've had a 
a few people come by and do that. So that's fantastic. That's um, right. We have a directory um, for those who are interested and who are, mm -hmm. who are tuning in. Um, there are places that we're trying to direct you to if you're looking for books or if you're looking for places to donate books, the, there is a rich community of giving and sharing. So um, I'm sorry, I interrupted you, Nicole. Go ahead. No, that's, oh yeah, no, it's fine. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we we just uh, became a 501c3 last March, right before the shutdown. Um, so, you know, it's hard to start a nonprofit during a pandemic, but we made the best of it. And um, I, I was saying earlier that uh, before we before we went live, that um, after everything shut down, I got a little bored. And so we packed up the little the bookmobile and went around and um, filled up little free libraries through Denver. Um, and then thanks to our executive director and all of our amazing volunteers, we were able to donate about 50,000 books last year to more than 70 different Denver organizations. So um, that's made, I mean, even though it's not technically a little free library, that's kind of our inspiration for creating this space and this nonprofit organization. It's in the Little um, Free Library family, that that whole community yeah. of giving, I think that we we welcome and look for. And in fact, you know, what Nicole has done in creating a non not for profit, a nonprofit arm, that's also other ways that some of our other stewards have been really very successful in generating donations to to um, to get books and, and give books. And so that's really terrific. Um, you did mention your bookmobile. And so we wanted to ask you if you were have any challenges, especially in uh, that that a bookmobile itself brings and, um, you know, some of the challenges and also some of the fun parts of having actually a mobile little free library. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of challenges because it's, it's a an old ambulance. It's a 1994 Ford ambulance that has been refurbished into a bookmobile. That's the fun part of it. And we um, had it wrapped with, you know, our logo and she's got a name. Her name is um, Mavis, the magical bookmobile. And I had the, um, when you buy an old ambulance, you're required to disconnect all the lights and the, the sirens so that people don't think it's an actual ambulance. Um, I know we're live and recorded, but I reconnected it. So now we can turn, we kids can go in there and turn all the lights on and play with, them. I mean, you know, they don't look like ambulance lights. They look different, but, um, but yeah, it's been, it's been a lot of fun to just kind of play around and refurbish it. Um, but that being said, it's, uh, it's an old diesel. So it's, oh. you know, it's, and she's an old girl. She needs a lot of maintenance. We have to, you know, restart her and drive her around the block every so often. Um, <laughs> it's Rosetta. Um, well, that, it'll make it challenging and fun. And it's a little bit of a, you know, you know, we'll try to, we'll try to uh, forgive you for the diesel exhaust part of it. But well, we're but, we're working on an electric option, oh, and especially because she doesn't have um, air conditioning. So it's. She's it might be time to retire her. It might be fine to retire. But you know, what it, what is appropriate about it being an ambulance, we had a, a Super Bowl uh, champion on um, and what Malcolm Mitchell, and he said books saved his life. So, and for a lot yeah. of people in these communities, Dr. Chanel can attest, books come into our lives at, at, at wonderful times and they're a gateway to so much and they're a way in which, you know, you can, you can give a lot. Um, it's, it's really very, very special. So we have more questions for you, of course. Um, did you add any specific kinds of books, especially for the people who frequent this library or you include you know, a little bit of everything? Are there ways in which you um, try to populate your little free libraries and your bookmobiles? Yeah, our bookmobile, um, mostly we like to stock it with children's books because that's typically the need. Um, when we're just, you know, going out into the community and giving away books, if we, if we stock it to take it to a market, that's, that's kind of a different story, but, um, it, the little free library in front of the store, um, it's a little bit of everything. And because we're a bookstore, I think the most fun thing about it is that as a bookstore, publishers send us advanced reader copies of books before they publish. Um, so when we pass them around to all of staff to read them, then we put them in the little free library for the community to enjoy. Hmm. Um, and it's very much a community give and take. We see people come up to the, to the little free library in front of our store and bring books 
take books with them. And, you know, there's some people that we get to know and recognize as our little free library patrons. And they never, you know, they don't, they are not our bookstore patrons. And that's, that's totally fine. You know, they, they, because that's, that's what it's there for. And yeah. so um, we see them out front of the library and we say hi and um, we're just happy that, that we can get more books out to the community because not everybody can afford them, obviously. Yeah, and the, the late Todd Bull said books bring people together and that, and that certainly is. You can have those conversations. One thing for you, Nicole, and for those of you who are listening, uh, when you talked about market, you know, farmers markets and so on, there's a great organization called readers2eaters.org um, that's actually founded by the former um, Philip Lee from Lee and Lowe Publishers. And so they have wonderful books like Zora's Zucchini and the Bread Lab and Roy Choi's book. So it's readers to readers.org and it's a great source. And they do lots of activities with schools and curriculum and other, um, I think it's readers to readers.org or maybe readers to readers.com. So I think Shelby's got me already covered. Um, so Here's our wonderful question for you. And there was a great bar in Washington, DC um, where they were always doing this. They would, they would do these special mixed drinks. But so what would be, what's your favorite book? And then how would you pair a particular wine or a drink or a cocktail with that book? And do you ever have, do you have some other wonderful pairings for all of us who would imbibe as we read or who would recommend <laughs> anything? So you have the floor. <laughs> okay. Uh, so my favorite book of all time is a little depressing, but it's Grapes of Wrath. Um, mm. I, I think I'm going to reread it again this summer, actually. Um, I just, I don't know. I just love the writing. I love the storyline. I'm somehow weirdly fascinated with the Great Depression. And yes, and I love, love, love Steinbeck. Um, and I would pair it with a um, the Cabernet, so the Cabernet from um, Bookwalter. It's a winery called Bookwalter. Um, and we, we carry it at this, at this store. Um, and it's my favorite wine on our list. And not just because it's, it's the winery is called Book Walter, um, but the, the winery does um, a lot of, a lot with literacy. They have a restaurant as well. And um, they do book clubs and um, book, book and wine pairings. Um, and they also give back to local uh, literary organizations. Oh, so I'm good. a big fan of that. So I think um, both of you in these cities and towns everywhere, talk, talk to your local wineries. I think more pairings should take place and more opportunities to connect books and book lovers and, and want book shares and wines and uh, other kinds of, uh, I think there may be a tequila market somewhere in there somewhere. So we should talk to The Rock and all these other people who love their love their drinks, but they should love books. I, I really do think so. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll let you guys in on it. A little announcement. We are, um, so we've been a bookstore wine bar um, specifically for years, we'll continue to be so, but uh, we are in the process of getting a full liquor license so that we can um, start serving some literary themed cocktails. Oh, that's so, fantastic. We'll be so, doing more yes, to so find your books and literary cocktails, exactly the place in uh, Washington, D.C., near the um, near the loyalty bookstore uh, used to do a lot of literary cocktails and then Tim Federley's book. Um, we'll have to look it up. We'll find it for you. And with all these, cause it's, um, I think my daughter who loves puns, um, I think it's called <laughs> gone with the gin. So, yeah. <laughs> so lots of fun with books and literary cocktails. Um, yeah, I absolutely. think some people are organizing road trips for Denver now. Tequila. Fantastic. There you go. Tequila well, Martin. and you have, you can stay in the apartment. Um, just be sure and, and bring a book to add to the library library and you can take some with you. Yeah, I, you know what? I'm heading to Denver. I don't know about anybody else. So we should, we should coordinate. <laughs> coordinate see me. Yeah, definitely. Well, that's just delightful. Um, we actually have ended our questions, but listen, uh, we didn't have what had having books or not having books mean to you as a child. And did you have some favorites? Yeah. So um, I grew up, um, South of St. Louis, actually, from um, I'd love to know where Dr. Snell grew up, but he, yeah, um, yeah. So I grew up in a small town, a couple hours south of St. Louis, and uh, we didn't have a bookstore growing up. We had the library, so I spent a lot of time at the the library, um, and 
what got me into reading was um, originally Nancy Drew, like a lot of little girls. Um, I was way into uh, Nancy Drew, Little House on the Prairie. And then um, once I got older, um, I discovered a whole new world with um, Alice Walker, Toni Morrison, Steinbeck, um, Salinger. Um, and, and, you know, all of these books just opened up a big wide world that I didn't know exist. Yeah. I mean, how could I have, you know, growing yeah. up in a small town yeah. and it really changed my life, you know, yeah. learning. And, and so as soon as I grew up and got out of high school, I was so ready to get out into the world and discover all these things that I had read about in books. And, um, so I'm, I'm definitely a product of what happens when kids read and get sucked into books and get sucked into different worlds, different lifestyles, you know, different um, histories, cultures. And it's, it's so incredibly important to get out of your bubble and the earlier the better. Yeah, yeah, it really crosses bridges. And well, I, I, one of my favorite books, I grew up in Southern California near, near a beach. And one of my favorite books was Tree Girls in Brooklyn. So my very first trip to New York, I, I was looking for an automat. The, uh, you know, like where are the little doors that have pies and other things? And, you know, where's the pickle guy? I, you know, I hadn't, I didn't even like pickles, but I had to try to find these places. So we, um, we have reached the end and we are so, so grateful to you and to Dr. Snell and, you know, um, for everybody to be part of this. Um, we are very, very excited to have had you. We could go on forever. Um, but I think that's that will be for a trip where we'll meet Dr. Schnell at the um, at the book bar uh, with some wine, and then we'll all just have a group chat um, at the author's residence. I I think that would be good. Um, so me down. I, <laughs> I want to thank you. I'm I'm all for it. This this is uh, just the beginning of more wonderful conversations, and I th I thank everybody for tuning in. Um, we'll have some more conversations later. Thank you so much, Nicole. All right, so we, um, I get to turn this over. Uh, if you've enjoyed this chapter of Little Free Library Unbound, please don't forget that we would love, if you could, to make a financial contribution to help us continue to offer these events. Um, donations to our nonprofit will also support our steward service activities so we can create more resources and opportunities for our stewards, our impact libraries, uh, and so on. And you can, you can donate at littlefreelibrary.org slash donate. If you want to see previous Little Free Library Unbound sessions, uh, we do have a YouTube channel so you can uh, take a look at that and find these conversations. I have the best time, so I'm very, very lucky to be part of this and be able to host. So Lexi, I turn it all over to you. Thank you, Anita. This is another great time. Thank you uh, to Nicole from Book Bar and Dr. Schnell. It's always exciting to hear, um, again, different, I think I say this every month, but the different applications of Little Free Libraries are always really fascinating to me um, because it really can um, fit any kind of situation or community or space. Um, the versatility is very, very cool. And it's great to hear practical examples of different ways Little Free Libraries can be applied and shared in different locations. Um, Anita also mentioned earlier that Nicola Yoon's uh, newest book, Instructions for Dancing, includes uh, a little snippet about the author, excuse me, the, the main character having a little free library. That book just came out, I think, um, early June. So keep an eye out for that. That was really exciting for us to see. Um, we also, of course, always see there are cartoons um, that circulate about little free libraries. And um, there was also the 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 movie Timmy Failure on Disney Plus, which is based on um, the middle reader book series. And you can see the little free library there in this scene uh, with Timmy and the polar bear, his partner in crime. Um, if you've seen little free libraries in commercials or movies or anywhere else kind of unexpected, um, are you, you should leave those in the chat um, so we can learn more about those. I tried to find some more screen grabs because I know they've appeared on 
uh, different shows and movies, but sometimes it's hard if you don't know exactly where to look, but those are always really delightful. And whenever our staff sees one or even anyone who knows our staff, it's always take a picture and send it along. So those are fun to see. I remember um, when Animal Crossing came out on Nintendo Switch, there was, there was a way to make a little free library on your Animal Crossing um, island. So that was really cool to see as well. Thank you so much for joining us again this month. Um, as Anita mentioned, you can share um, a financial contribution to help us keep doing programs like this, as well as supporting our Impact Library program, our Reading Color program, and support Steward Services, which help us um, offer events like this and keep supporting our stewards as they share books in all their unique communities. Um, we hope you'll join us again next month for chapter seven and Shelby's gonna leave a link in the chat. We are going to talk about the issue of the summer slide and engaging middle grade and young adult readers um, with author Angela Dominguez who wrote the Stella Diaz series. She is also um, an award winning illustrator and we will have one of our teenage stewards, Mackenzie Cox joining us to talk about um, what it's like for her not only to steward a little free library as a teenager, but what she and her friends are reading, um, what keeps them motivated to read in those summer months when we know that um, kids are less engaged with books and losing reading progress that they have made um, along the school year, especially I think it'll be interesting to hear what um, slide with the pandemic and the way school has changed for kids in the last year. So. We will hear more about that and have some more information about Summer Slide and some details about how that affects students and kids. Um, Shelby has shared where you can see other chapters of Unbound and she's going to share the registration link for next month. If you haven't already, we encourage you to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter, and you can keep in touch with us. And if you're here tonight, thank you again so much for joining us. You'll receive an email tomorrow with a quick survey requesting your feedback on tonight's event. And you can enter to win one of five book bundles from our partners at Reading is Fundamental. So if you would share your feedback with us, we would love to hear it. Um, as always, thank you so much for being here with us. Take care and we'll see you next time.